Hello friends and welcome to this 11th and final installment in this calm reading of The Secret Garden. Next week we will return to a short story by Lucy Maud Montgomery. But today we will finish chapters 26, Its Mother, and chapter 27, In the Garden. So let us find a place where we can safely and comfortably listen to these chapters. And let us begin. Chapter 16 Its Mother The belief in the magic was an abiding thing. After the morning's incantations, Colin sometimes gave them magic lectures. I like to do it, he explained, because when I grow up and make great scientific discoveries, I shall be obliged to lecture about them. And so, this is practice. I can only give short lectures now, because I am very young, and besides, Ben Weatherstaff would feel as if he were in church, and he would go to sleep. The best thing about lecturing, said Ben, is that a chap can get up and say what he pleases, and no other chap can answer him back. I wouldn't be again lecturing a bit myself, sometimes. But when Colin held forth under his tree, old Ben fixed devouring eyes on him, and kept them there. He looked him over with critical affection. It was not so much the lecturer which interested him, as the legs which looked straighter and stronger each day. The boyish head which held itself up so well, the once sharp chin and hollow cheeks, which had filled and rounded out, and the eyes which had begun to hold the light he remembered in another pair. Sometimes, when Colin felt Ben's earnest gaze meant that he was much impressed, he wondered what he was reflecting on, and once, when he had seemed quite entranced, he questioned him. What are you thinking about, Ben Weatherstaff? he asked. I was thinking, answered Ben, as I'd warned that I'd gone up three or four pounds this week. I was looking at their calves and their shoulders. I like to get thee on a pair of scales. It's the magic and, and Mrs. Sowerby's buns and milk and things, said Colin. You see, the scientific experiment has succeeded. That morning, Dickon was too late to hear the lecture. When he came, he was ruddy with running, and his funny face looked more twinkling than usual. As they had a good deal of reading to do after the rains, they fell to work. They always had plenty to do after a warm, deep, sinking rain. The moisture, which was good for the flowers, was also good for the weeds, which thrust up tiny blades of grass and points of leaves which must be pulled up before their roots took too firm hold. Colin was as good at weeding as anyone in these days, and he could lecture while he was doing it. The magic works best when you work, yourself, he said this morning. You can feel it in your bones and muscles. I am going to read books about bones and muscles, but I am going to write a book about magic. I am making it up now. I keep finding out things. It was not very long after he had said this that he laid down his trowel and stood up on his feet. He had been silent for several minutes, and they had seen that he was thinking out lectures, as he often did. When he dropped his trowel and stood upright, it seemed to Mary and Dickon as if a sudden strong thought had made him do it. He stretched himself out to his tallest height, and he threw out his arms exultantly. Color glowed in his face, and his strange eyes widened with joyfulness. 
all at once he had realized something to the full. Mary, Dickon, he cried, just look at me. They stopped the reading and looked at him. Do you remember that first morning you brought me in here? he demanded. Dickon was looking at him very hard. Being an animal charmer, he could see more things than most people could, and many of them were things he never talked about. He saw some of them now in this boy. Aye, that we do, he answered. Mary looked hard too, but she said nothing. Just this minute, said Colin, all at once I remembered it myself, when I looked at my hand digging with the trowel and I had to stand up on my feet to see if it was real. And it is real. I am well. I am well. Aye, that the art, said Dickon. I am well. I am well, said Colin again, and his face went quite red all over. He had known it before in a way. He had hoped it, and felt it, and thought about it. But just at that minute, something had rushed all through him. A sort of rapturous belief and realization, and it had been so strong that he could not help calling out. I shall live forever and ever and ever, he cried grandly. I shall find out thousands and thousands of things. I shall find out about people and creatures and everything that grows, like Dickon. And I shall never stop making magic. I'm well. I'm well. I feel, I feel as if I want to shout out something. Something thankful, joyful. Ben Weatherstaff, who had been working near a rose bush, glanced round at him. Zahm had seen the doxology he suggested in his driest grunt. He had no opinion of the doxology, and he did not make the suggestion with any particular reverence. But Colin was of the exploring mind, and he knew nothing about the doxology. What is that? he inquired. Dickon can sing it for thee, I'll warrant, replied Ben Weatherstaff. Dickon answered with his all-perceiving animal charmer smile. They'll sing it in church, he said. Mother says she believes the Skylarks sing it when they gets up in the morning. If she says that, it must be a nice song, Colin answered. I've never been in a church myself. I was always too ill. Sing it, Dickon. I want to hear it. Dickon was quite simple and unaffected about it. He understood what Colin felt better than Colin did himself. He understood by a sort of instinct so natural that he did not know it was understanding. He pulled off his cap and looked round, still smiling. Thou must take off the cap, he said to Colin, and so manda, Ben, and the man stand up. The nose? Colin took off his cap, and the sun shone on and warmed his thick hair, as he watched Dickon intently. Ben Weatherstaff scrambled up from his knees, and bared his head too, with a sort of puzzled, half-resentful look on his old face, as if he didn't know exactly why he was doing this remarkable thing. Dickon stood out among the trees and rose bushes and began to sing in quite a simple, manner of fact way and in a nice, strong boy voice. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above ye, heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. When he had finished, Ben Weatherstaff was standing quite still with his jaws set obstinately but with a disturbed look in his eyes fixed on Colin. Colin's face was thoughtful and appreciative. 
It is a very nice song, he said. I like it. Perhaps it means just what I mean when I want to shout out that I am thankful of the magic. He stopped and thought in a puzzled way. Perhaps they are both the same thing. How can we know the exact names of everything? Sing it again, Dickon. Let us try, Mary. I want to sing it too. It's my song. How does it begin? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. And they sang it again. And Mary and Colin lifted their voices as musically as they could. And Dickens spelled quite loud and beautiful. And at the second line, Ben Weatherstaff raspingly cleared his throat, and at the third line he joined in with such vigor that it seemed almost savage. And when the Amen came to an end, Mary observed that the very same thing had happened to him which had happened when he found out that Colin was not a cripple. His chin was twitching, and he was staring and winking, and his leathery old cheeks were red. I'd never seen no sense in the doxology afore, he said hoarsely. But I may change my mind in time. I should say that gone up five pounds this week, Mr. Colin. Five on them. Colin was looking across the garden at something attracting his attention, and his expression had become a startled one. Who is coming in here? he said quickly. Who is it? The door in the ivied wall had been pushed gently open, and a woman had entered. She had come in with the last line of their song, and she had stood still, listening and looking at them. With the ivy behind her, the sunlight drifted through the trees, and dappling her long blue cloak, and her nice fresh face smiling across the greenery, she was rather like a softly colored illustration in one of Colin's books. She had wonderful, affectionate eyes, which seemed to take everything in, all of them, even Ben Weatherstaff and the creatures, and every flower that was in bloom. Unexpectedly, as she had appeared, not one of them felt that she was an intruder at all. Dickens' eyes lighted like lamps. It's mother, that's who it is, he cried, and went across the grass at a run. Colin began to move toward her too, and Mary went with him. They both felt the pulses beat faster. It's mother, Dickon said again, when they met halfway. I knowed I wanted to see her, and I told her where the door was hit. Colin held out his hand with a sort of flushed royal shyness, but his eyes quite devoured her face. Even when I was ill, I wanted to see you, he said. You and Dickon and the secret garden. I never wanted to see anyone or anything before. The sight of his uplifted face brought about a sudden change in her own. She flushed and the corners of her mouth shook and a mist seemed to sweep over her eyes. A hey, dear lad, she broke out tremendously. A hey, dear lad, as if she had not known she were going to say it. She did not say Mr. Colin, but just dear lad quite suddenly. She might have said it to Dickon in the same way if she had seen something in his face which touched her. Colin liked it. Are you surprised because I am so well? he asked. She put her hand on his shoulder and smiled the mist out of her eyes. Aye, that I am, she said, but art so like thy mother thou made my heart jump. Do you think, said Colin a little awkwardly, that will make my father like me? I for sure, dear lad, she answered, and she gave his shoulder a soft, quick pat. He mun come home. He mun come home. Susan Sowerby, said Ben Weatherstaff, getting close to her, 
Look at the lad's legs. Wilt thou? They was like drumsticks and stockings two months ago. And I heard folk tell as they was bandy. Bandy and knockneed both at the same time. Look at them now. Susan Sowerby laughed a comfortable laugh. They're going to be fine, strong lad's legs in a bit, she said. Let him go on playing and working in the garden, and eating hearty and drinking plenty of good sweet milk. And there'll not be a finer pair in Yorkshire. Thank God for it. She put both hands on Mistress Mary's shoulders, and looked her little face over in a motherly fashion. And thee too she said, that grown near as hardy as our Elizabeth Ellen. I'll warrant that like thy mother too. Our Martha told me, as Mrs. Medlock heard, she was a pretty woman. Thou'lt be like a blush rose when thou grows up, my little lass, bless thee. She did not mention that when Martha came home on her day out and described the plain, sallow child, she had said that she had no confidence whatever in what Mrs. Medlock had heard. It doesn't stand to reason that a pretty woman could be the mother of such a foul little lass, she had added obstinately. Mary had not had time to pay much attention to her changing face. She had only known that she looked different and seemed to have a great deal more hair and that it was growing very fast. But remembering her pleasure in looking at the Memsa heap in the past, she was glad to hear that she might some day look like her. Susan Sowerby went round the garden with them, and was told the whole story of it, and shown every bush and tree which had come alive. Colin walked on one side of her, and Mary on the other. Each of them kept looking up at her comfortable rosy face, secretly curious about the delightful feeling she gave them, a sort of warm, supported feeling. It seemed as if she understood them as Dickon understood his creatures. She stooped over the flowers and talked about them as if they were children. So it followed her and once or twice caught at her and flew upon her shoulder as if it were Dickens. When they told her about the robin and the first flight of the young ones, she laughed a motherly little mellow laugh in her throat. I suppose learning them to fly is like learning children to walk. But I feared I should be all in a worried if mine had wings instead of legs, she said. It was because she seemed such a wonderful woman in her nice moorland cottage way that at last she was told about the magic. Do you believe in magic? asked Colin after he had explained about Indian fakirs. I do hope you do. That I do, lad, she answered. I never knowed it by that name, but what does the name matter? I warned they call it a different name in France, and a different one in Germany. The same thing as set the seed swelling and the sun shining, made thee a well lad, and it's the good thing. It isn't like us poor fools, as think it matters if us is called out of our names. The big good thing doesn't stop to worry it. Bless thee. It goes on making worlds by the million, worlds like us. Never thee stop believing in the big good thing and knowing the world's full of it, and call it what thou likes. Thou wert singing to it when I come into the garden. I felt so joyful, said Colin, opening his beautiful strange eyes at her. Suddenly I felt how different I was, how strong my arms and legs were, you know, and how I could dig and stand, and I jumped up and wanted to shout out something to anything that would listen. The magic listened when thou sung the doxology. It would have listened to anything that sung. It was the joy that mattered. A hey, lad, lad, what's names to the joy maker? And she gave his shoulder a quick soft pat again. 
she had packed a basket which held a regular feast this morning, and when the hungry hour came, and Dickon brought it out from its hiding place, she sat down with them under their tree and watched them devour their food, laughing and quite gloating over their appetites. She was full of fun and made them laugh at all sorts of odd things. She told them stories in broad Yorkshire and taught them new words. She laughed as if she could not help it when they told her of the increasing difficulty there was in pretending that Colin was still a fretful invalid. You see, we can't help laughing nearly all the time when we are together, explained Colin. And it doesn't sound ill at all. We try to choke it back, but it will burst out, and that sounds worse than ever. There's one thing that comes into my mind so often, said Mary. And I can scarcely ever hold in when I think of it suddenly. I keep thinking, suppose Colin's face should get to look like a full moon. It isn't like one yet, but he gets a tiny bit fatter every day. And suppose some morning it should look like one. What should we do? Bless us all. I can see thou has a good bit of play actin' to do, said Susan Sowerby. But thou won't have to keep it up much longer. Mr. Craven will come home. Do you think he will? asked Colin. Why? Susan Sowerby chuckled softly. I suppose it had nigh break thy heart if he found out before thou told him in thy own way, she said. Thus laid awake nights planning it. I couldn't bear anyone else to tell him, said Colin. I think about different ways every day. I think now I just want to run into his room. That be a fine start for him, said Susan Sowerby. I'd like to see his face, lad. I would that. He mun come back. He mun. One of the things they talked of was the visit they were to make to her cottage. They planned it all. They were to drive over the moor and lunch out of doors among the heather. They would see all the twelve children and Dickens' garden and would not come back until they were tired. Susan Sowerby got up at last to return to the house and Mrs. Medlock. It was time for Colin to be wheeled back also. But before he got into his chair, he stood quite close to Susan and fixed his eyes on her with a kind of bewildered adoration. And he suddenly cut hold of the fold of a blue cloak and held it fast. You are just what I... what I wanted, he said. I wish you were my mother as well as Dickens. All at once, Susan Sowerby bent down and drew him with her warm arms close against her bosom under the blue cloak, as if he had been Dickens' brother. The quick mist swept over her eyes. Eh, hey, dear lad, she said, thy own mother's in this year very garden, I do believe. She couldn't keep out of it. Thy father mun come back to thee, he mun. Chapter 27 In the Garden In each century, since the beginning of the world, wonderful things have been discovered. In the last century, more amazing things were found out than in any century before. In this new century, hundreds of things still more astounding will be brought to light. At first, people refuse to believe that a strange new thing can be done. Then they begin to hope it can be done. Then they see it can be done. Then it is done, and all the world wonders why it was not done centuries ago. One of the new things people began to find out in the last century was that thoughts, just mere thoughts, are as powerful as electric batteries, as good for one as sunlight is, or as bad for one as poison. 
to let a sad thought or a bad one get into your mind is as dangerous as letting a scarlet fever germ into your body. If you let it stay there, after it has got in, you may never get over it as long as you live. So long as Mistress Mary's mind was full of disagreeable thoughts about her dislikes and sour opinions of people and her determination not to be pleased by or interested in anything, she was a yellow-faced, sickly, bored, and wretched child. Circumstances, however, were very kind to her, though she was not at all aware of it. They began to push her about for her own good. When her mind gradually filled itself with robins and moorland cottages, crowded with children, with queer crabbed old gardeners and common little Yorkshire housemates, with springtime and with its secret gardens coming alive day by day, and also with the moor boy and his creatures, there was no room left for the disagreeable thoughts, which affected her liver and her digestion and made her yellow and tired. So long as Colin shut himself up in his room, and thought only of his fears and weakness, and his detestation of people who looked at him, and reflected hourly on humps and early death, he was a hysterical, half-crazy little hypochondriac, who knew nothing of the sunshine and the spring, and also did not know that he could get well and could stand upon his feet if he tried to do it. When new, beautiful thoughts began to push out the old hideous ones, life began to come back to him. His blood ran healthily through his veins and strength poured into him like a flood. His scientific experiment was quite practical and simple, and there was nothing weird about it at all. Much more surprising things can happen to anyone who, when a disagreeable or discouraged thought comes into his mind, just has the sense to remember in time and push it out by putting in an agreeable, determinedly courageous one. Two things cannot be in one place. Where you tend a rose, my lad, a thistle cannot grow. While the secret garden was coming alive, and the two children were coming alive with it, there was a man wandering about certain faraway beautiful places in the Norwegian fjords and the valleys and mountains of Switzerland. And he was a man who for ten years had kept his mind filled with dark and heartbroken thinking. He had not been courageous. He had never tried to put any other thoughts in the place of the dark ones. He had wandered by blue lakes and thought them. And he had lain on mountainsides with sheets of deep blue gentians blooming all about him and flower breaths filling all the air and he had thought them. A terrible sorrow had fallen upon him when he had been happy and he had let his soul fill itself with blackness, and had refused obstinately to allow any rift of light to pierce through. He had forgotten and deserted his home and his duties. When he travelled about, darkness so brooded over him that the sight of him was a wrong done to other people because it was as if he poisoned the air about him with gloom. Most strangers thought he must be either half mad or a man with some hidden crime on his soul. He was a tall man with a drawn face, and crooked shoulders, and the name he always entered on hotel registers was Archibald Craven, Mistlethwaite Manor, Yorkshire, England. He had travelled far and wide since the day he saw Mistress Mary in his study, and told her she might have her bit of earth. He had been in the most beautiful places in Europe, though he had remained nowhere more than a few days. He had chosen the quietest and remotest spots. 
he had been on the tops of mountains whose heads were in the clouds, and had looked down on other mountains when the sun rose, and touched them with such light as made it seem as if the world were just being born. But the light had never seemed to touch himself until one day when he realized that for the first time in ten years a strange thing had happened. He was in a wonderful valley in the Austrian Tyrol, and he had been walking along through such beauty as might have lifted any man's soul out of shadow. He had walked a long way, and it had not lifted his. But at last he had felt tired and had thrown himself down to rest on a carpet of moss by a stream. It was a clear little stream, which ran quite merrily along on its narrow way, through the luscious, damp greenness. Sometimes it made a sound rather like very low laughter as it bubbled over and round stones. He saw birds come and dip their heads to drink in it, and then flick their wings and fly away. It seemed like a thing alive, and yet its tiny voice made the stillness seem deeper. The valley was very, very still. As he sat gazing into the clear running of the water, Archibald Craven gradually felt his mind and body grow quiet, as quiet as the valley itself. He wondered if he were going to sleep, but he was not. He sat and gazed at the sunlight water, and his eyes began to see things growing at its edge. There was one lovely mass of blue forget-me-nots growing so close to the stream that its leaves were wet, and at these he found himself looking as he remembered he had looked at such things years ago. He was actually thinking tenderly how lovely it was and what wonders of blue its hundreds of little blossoms were. He did not know that just that simple thought was slowly filling his mind, filling and filling it until other things were softly pushed aside. It was as if a sweet clear spring had begun to rise in a stagnant pool, and had risen and risen until at last it swept the dark water away. But of course, he did not think of this himself. He only knew that the valley seemed to grow quieter and quieter as he sat and stared at the bright, delicate blueness. He did not know how long he sat there or what was happening to him. But at last he moved as if he were awakening, and he got up slowly and stood on the moss carpet, drawing a long, deep, soft breath and wondering at himself. Something seemed to have been unbound and released in him very quietly. What is it? he said almost in a whisper, and he passed his hand over his forehead. I almost feel as if I were alive. I do not know enough about the wonderfulness of undiscovered things to be able to explain how this had happened to him. Neither does anyone else yet. He did not understand it at all himself. But he remembered the strange hour, months afterward, when he was at Misselthwaite again, and he found out quite by accident that on this very day Colin had cried out, as he went into the secret garden. I'm going to live forever and ever and ever. The singular calmness remained with him the rest of the evening. And he slept, a new reposeful sleep. But it was not with him very long. He did not know that it could be kept. But the next night, he had opened the doors wide to his dark thoughts, and they had come trooping and rushing back. He left the valley and went on his wandering way again. But, strange as it seemed to him, there were minutes, sometimes half-hours, when without his knowing why, 
the black burden seemed to lift itself again, and he knew he was a living man and not a dead one. Slowly, slowly, for no reason that he knew of, he was coming alive with the garden. As the golden summer changed into the deep golden autumn, he went to the lake of Como. There he found the loveliness of a dream. He spent his days upon the crystal blueness of the lake, or he walked back into the soft, thick verdure of the hills and tramped until he was tired so that he might sleep. But by this time he had begun to sleep better, he knew, and his dreams had ceased to be a terror to him. Perhaps, he thought, my body is growing stronger. It was growing stronger, but because of the rare peaceful hours when his thoughts were changed, his soul was slowly growing stronger too. He began to think of Mistlethwaite and wonder if he should not go home. Now and then he wondered vaguely about his boy and asked himself what he should feel when he went and stood by the carved four-posted bed again and looked down at the sharply chiseled ivory-white face while it slept and the black lashes rimmed so startlingly the close-shut eyes. He shrank from it. One marvel of a day, he had walked so far that when he returned the moon was high and full and all the world was purple shadow and silver. The stillness of lake and shore and wood was so wonderful that he did not go into the villa he lived in. He walked down to a little bowered terrace at the water's edge and sat upon a seat and breathed in all the heavenly scents of the night. He felt a strange calmness stealing over him, and it grew deeper and deeper until he fell asleep. He did not know when he fell asleep, and when he began to dream. His dream was so real that he did not feel as if he were dreaming. He remembered afterward how intensely wide awake and alert he had thought he was. He thought that he sat and breathed in the scent of the late roses, and listened to the lapping of the water at his feet, he heard a voice calling. It was sweet and clear and happy and far away. It seemed very far, but he heard it as distinctly as if it had been at his very side. Archie, 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 it said, and then again, sweeter and clearer than before. Archie, Archie. He thought he sprang to his feet, not even startled. It was such a real voice, and it seemed so natural that he should hear it. Lilius, Lilius, he answered. Lilius, where are you? In the garden. It came back like a sound from a golden flute. In the garden. And then the dream ended. But he did not awaken. He slept soundly and sweetly all through the lovely night. When he did awake at last, it was brilliant morning, and the servant was standing staring at him. He was an Italian servant and was accustomed, as all the servants of the villa were, to accepting without question any strange thing his foreign master might do. No one ever knew when he would go out or come in or where he would choose to sleep or if he would roam about the garden or lie in the boat on the lake all night. The man held a salver with some letters on it, and he waited quietly until Mr. Craven took them. When he had gone away, Mr. Craven sat a few moments holding them in his hand and looking at the lake. His strange calm was still upon him, and something more, 
a lightness, as if the cruel thing which had been done had not happened as he thought, as if something had changed. He was remembering the dream, the real, real dream. In the garden, he said, wondering at himself. In the garden, but the door is locked, and the key is buried deep. When he glanced at the lettuce a few minutes later, he saw that one lying at the top of the rest was an English letter and came from Yorkshire. It was directed in a plain woman's hand, but it was not a hand he knew. He opened it, scarcely thinking of the writer, but the first words attracted his attention at once. Dear Sir, I am Susan Sowerby that made bold to speak to you once on the moor. It was about Miss Mary I spoke. I will make bold to speak again. Please, sir, I would come home if I was you. I think you would be glad to come, and, if you will excuse me, sir, I think your lady would ask you to come if she were here. Your obedient servant, Susan Sowerby. Mr. Craven read the letter twice, before he put it back in its envelope. He kept thinking about the dream. I will go back to Misselthwaite, he said. Yes, I'll go at once. And he went through the garden to the villa, and ordered Pitcher to prepare for his return to England. In a few days he was in Yorkshire again. And on his long railroad journey, he found himself thinking of his boy, as he had never thought in all the ten years past. During those years, he had only wished to forget him. Now, though he did not intend to think about him, memories of him constantly drifted into his mind. He remembered the black days when he had raved like a madman, because the child was alive and the mother was dead. He had refused to see it, and when he had gone to look at it, at last it had been such a weak, wretched thing that everyone had been sure it would die in a few days. But to the surprise of those who took care of it, the days passed and it lived. And then everyone believed it would be a deformed and crippled creature. He had not meant to be a bad father, but he had not felt like a father at all. He had supplied doctors and nurses and luxuries, but he had shrunk from the mere thought of the boy and had buried himself in his own misery. The first time after a year's absence, he returned to Misselthwaite, and the small miserable-looking thing languidly and indifferently lifted to his face the great grey eyes with black lashes round them, so like and yet so horribly unlike the happy eyes he had adored. He could not bear the sight of them, and turned away pale as death. After that he scarcely ever saw him, except when he was asleep, and all he knew of him was that he was a confirmed invalid. With a vicious, hysterical, half-insane temper, he could only be kept from furies dangerous to himself by being given his own way in every detail. All this was not an uplifting thing to recall, but as the train whirled him through mountain passes and golden plains, and the man who was coming alive began to think in a new way, and he thought long and steadily and deeply. Perhaps I have been all wrong for ten years, he said to himself. Ten years is a long time. It may be too late to do anything, quite too late. What have I been thinking of? Of course, this was the wrong magic, to begin by saying too late. Even Colin could have told him that. But he knew nothing of magic, either black or white. This he had yet to learn. He wondered if Susan Sowerby had taken courage and written to him 
only because the motherly creature had realized that the boy was much worse, was fatally ill. If he had not been under the spell of the curious calmness which had taken possession of him, he would have been more wretched than ever. But the calm had brought a sort of courage and hope with it. Instead of giving way to thoughts of the worst, he actually found he was trying to believe in better things. Could it be possible that she sees that I may be able to do him good and control him, he thought. I will go and see her on my way to Misselthwaite. But when on his way across the moor he had stopped a carriage at a cottage, seven or eight children who were playing about, gathered in a group, and bobbing seven or eight friendly and polite curtsies, told him that their mother had gone to the other side of the moor early in the morning to help a woman who had a new baby. Our Dickon, they volunteered, was over at the manor working in one of the gardens, where he went several days each week. Mr. Craven looked over the collection of sturdy little bodies and round red-cheeked faces, each one grinning in its own particular way, and he awoke to the fact that they were a healthy, likable lot. He smiled at their friendly grins and took a golden sovereign from his pocket and gave it to our Elizabeth Ellen, who was the oldest. If you divide that into eight parts, there will be half a crown for each of you, he said. Then, amid grins and chuckles and bobbing of curtsies, he drove away, leaving ecstasy and nudging elbows and little jumps of joy behind. The drive across the wonderfulness of the moor was a soothing thing. Why did it seem to give him a sense of homecoming which he had been sure he could never feel again? That sense of the beauty of land and sky and purple bloom of distance and a warming of the heart at drawing nearer to the great old house which had held those of his blood for six hundred years how he had driven away from it the last time. Shuddering to think of its closed rooms and the boy lying in the four-posted bed with the brocade hangings. Was it possible that perhaps he might find him changed a little, for the better, and that he might overcome his shrinking from him? How real that dream had been, how wonderful and clear the voice which called back to him. In the garden, in the garden. I will try to find the key, he said. I will try to open the door. I must, though I don't know why. When he arrived at the manor, the servants who received him with the usual ceremony noticed that he looked better, and that he did not go to the remote rooms where he usually lived attended by Pitcher. He went into the library and sent for Mrs. Medlock. She came to him somewhat excited and curious and flustered. How is Master Colin, Medlock? he inquired. Well, sir, Mrs. Medlock answered, he's, he's different in a manner of speaking. Worse, he suggested. Mrs. Medlock really was flushed. Well, you see, sir, she tried to explain. Neither Dr. Craven, nor the nurse, nor me can exactly make him out. Why is that? To tell the truth, sir, Master Colin might be better, and he might be changing for the worse. His appetite, sir, is past understanding. And his ways. Has he become more, more peculiar? Her master asked, knitting his brows anxiously. That's it, sir, he's growing very peculiar. When you compare him with what he used to be, he used to eat nothing, and then suddenly he began to eat something enormous, and then he stopped again, all at once, and the meals were sent back, just as they used to be. You never knew, sir, perhaps, that out of doors he never would let himself be taken. 
The things we've gone through to get him to go out in his chair would leave a body trampling like a leaf. He'd throw himself into such a state that Dr. Craven said he couldn't be responsible for forcing him. Well, sir, just without warning, not long after one of his worst tantrums, he suddenly insisted on being taken out every day by Miss Mary and Susan Sowerby's boy Dickon, that could push his chair. He took a fancy to both Miss Mary and Dickon, and Dickon brought his tame animals, and, if you'll credit it, sir, out of doors he will stay from morning until night. How does he look? was the next question. If he took his food natural, sir, you'd think he was putting on flesh. But we're afraid it may be a sort of bloat. He laughs sometimes in a queer way when he's alone with Miss Mary. He never used to laugh at all. Dr. Craven is coming to see you at once, if you'll allow him. He never was as puzzled in his life. Where is Master Colin now? Mr. Craven asked. In the garden, sir. He's always in the garden, though not a human creature is allowed to go near for fear they'll look at him. Mr. Craven scarcely heard her last words. In the garden, he said. And after he had sent Mrs. Medlock away, he stood and repeated it again and again. In the garden. He had to make an effort to bring himself back to the place he was standing in, and when he felt he was on earth again, he turned and went out of the room. He took his way, as Mary had done, through the door in the shrubbery, and among the laurels, and the fountain beds. The fountain was playing now, and was encircled by beds of brilliant autumn flowers. He crossed the lawn and turned into the long walk by the ivied walls. He did not walk quickly, but slowly, and his eyes were on the path. He felt as if he were being drawn back to the place he had so long forsaken, and he did not know why. As he drew near to it, his step became still more slowly. He knew where the door was, even though the ivy hung thick over it. But he did not know exactly where it lay that buried key. So he stopped and stood still, looking about him, and almost the moment after he had passed, he started and listened, asking himself if he were walking in a dream. The ivy hung thick over the door. The key was buried under the shrubs. No human being had passed that portal for ten lonely years. And yet, Inside the garden there were sounds. They were the sounds of running, shuffling feet, seeming to chase round and round under the trees. They were strange sounds of lowered, suppressed voices, exclamations and smothered, joyous cries. It seemed actually like the laughter of young things, the uncontrollable laughter of children who were trying not to be hurt, but who, in a moment or so, as the excitement mounted, would burst forth. What in heaven's name was he dreaming of? What in heaven's name did he hear? Was he losing his reason and thinking? He heard things which were not for human ears. Was it that the far clear voice had meant? And then the moment came. The uncontrollable moment when the sounds forgot to hush themselves. The feet ran faster and faster. They were nearing the garden door. There was quick, strong, young breathing and a wild outbreak of laughing shouts, which could not be contained. And the door in the wall was flung wide open, the sheet of ivy swinging back, and the boy burst through it at full speed and, without seeing the outsider, dashed almost into his arms. Mr. Craven had extended them just in time to save him from falling as a result of his unseeing dash against him, and when he held him away to look at him in amazement at his being there, 
he truly gasped for breath. He was a tall boy and a handsome one. He was glowing with life, and his running had sent splendid color leaping to his face. He threw the thick hair back from his forehead and lifted a pair of strange gray eyes. Eyes full of boyish laughter and rimmed with black lashes like the French. It was the eyes which made Mr. Craven gasp for breath. Who, what, who, he stammered. This was not what Colin had expected. This was not what he had planned. He had never thought of such a meeting. And yet, to come dashing out, winning a race, perhaps it was even better. He drew himself up to his very tallest. Mary, who had been running with him and had dashed through the door too, believed that he managed to make himself look taller than he had ever looked before. Inches taller. Father, he said, I'm Colin. You can't believe it. I scarcely can myself. I am Colin. Like Mrs. Medlock, he did not understand what his father meant when he said hurriedly, In the garden. In the garden. Yes, hurried on Colin. It was the garden that did it. And Mary, and Dickon, and the creatures, and the magic. No one knows. We kept it to tell you when you came. I'm well. I can beat Mary in a race. I'm going to be an athlete. He said it all so like a healthy boy, his face flushed, his words tumbling over each other in his eagerness, that Mr. Craven's soul shook with unbelievable joy. Colin put out his hand and laid it on his father's arm. Aren't you glad, father? he ended. Aren't you glad I'm going to live forever and ever and ever? Mr. Craven put his hands on both the boy's shoulders and held him still. He knew he dared not even try to speak for a moment. Take me into the garden, my boy, he said at last, and tell me all about it. And so they led him in. The place was a wilderness of autumn gold and purple and violet blue and flaming scarlet and on every side were sheaves of late lilies standing together. Lilies which were white, or white and ruby. He remembered well, when the first of them had been planted, that just at this season of the year, their late glories should reveal themselves. Late roses climbed and hung and clustered, and the sunshine deepening the hue of the yellowing trees made one feel that one stood in an embowered temple of gold. The newcomer stood silent, just as the children had done when they came into its grayness. He looked round and round. I thought it would be dead, he said. Mary thought so at first, said Colin, but it came alive. Then they sat down under the tree, all but Colin who wanted to stand while he told the story. It was the strangest thing he had ever heard, Archibald Craven thought, as it was poured forth in headlong boy fashion. Mystery and magic and wild creatures and weird midnight meeting, the coming of the spring, the passion of insulted pride which had dragged the young Raja to his feet, to defy old Ben Weatherstaff to his face. The odd companionship, the play-acting, the great secrets so carefully kept. The listener laughed until tears came into his eyes, and sometimes tears came into his eyes when he was not laughing. The athlete, the lecturer, the scientific discoverer was a laughable, lovable, healthy, young human thing. Now, he said at the end of the story, it need not be a secret any more. 
I dare say it will frighten them nearly into fits when they see me, but I am never going to get into the chair again. I shall walk back with you, father, to the house. Ben Weatherstaff's duty rarely took him away from the gardens, but on this occasion he made an excuse to carry some vegetables to the kitchen and being invited into the servants' hall by Mrs. Medlock to drink a glass of beer. He was on the spot, as he had hoped to be, when the most dramatic event Misselthwaite Manor had seen during the present generation actually took place. One of the windows looking upon the courtyard gave also a glimpse of the lawn. Mrs. Medlock, knowing Ben had come from the gardens, hoped that he might have caught sight of his master and even by chance of his meeting with Master Colin. Did he see either of them, whether staff? she asked. Ben took his beer mug from his mouth and wiped his lips with the back of his hand. Aye, that I did he answered with a shrewdly significant air. Both of them, suggested Mrs. Medlock. Both of them, returned Ben Weatherstaff. Thank you kindly, ma'am. I could sup up another mug of it. Together, said Mrs. Medlock hastily, overfilling his beer mug in her excitement. Together, ma'am, and Ben gulped down half of his new mug at one gulp. Where was Master Colin? How did he look? What did they say to each other? I did not hear that, said Ben, along or only being on the step ladder, looking over the wall. But I'll tell thee this. There's been things going on outside, as you house people knows not about. And what thou'll find out, thou'll find out soon. And it was not two minutes before he swallowed the last of his beer and waved his mug solemnly toward the window, which took in through the shrubbery a piece of the lawn. Look there, he said. If thou's curious, look what's coming across the grass. When Mrs. Medlock looked, she threw up her hands and gave a little shriek and every man and woman servant within hearing bolted across the servants' hall and stood looking through the window, with their eyes almost starting out of their heads. Across the lawn came the master of Misselthwaite, and he looked as many of them had never seen him. And by his side, with his head up in the air, and his eyes full of laughter, walked, as strongly and steadily as any boy in Yorkshire, Master Colin.